In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, let us uh, pray. Ask for the Lord's help. Let us put ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Let us open our heart to his grace, to his love, to his mercy. Uh, let us be like little children with the simplicity and trust of the child to run and go towards the Lord. And our, offer ourselves to Him. And give us, Lord, graciously your Holy Spirit. Guide us from within. Show us your light, your discernment. Incline our will towards your will. And give us the joy to serve you. We ask you this through the powerful intercession of Our Lady, who is always present among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming uh, today. Today is different from the usual teaching. As you know, uh, first and foremost, you have the thesis, which is behind uh, today's uh, subject. Uh, I will explain uh, everything. So it's, it's rather a little bit more uh, intellectual, uh, more, uh, to my uh, perception, a bit more um, abstract, not necessarily immediately uh, close to um, our daily life and uh, realities. But what I will try to offer you today is part a small part of the history of the church, uh, more centered toward uh, last century, which is uh, more or less um, what Father Louis Guillet, who is the subject, is the author I'm studying for the PhD. This is his picture. He died in 92, but he's born in 1902. So 1902, 1992, 90 years old, uh, he dies. Um, he covers more or less the history of the entire last century. But in order for us to understand an author, to understand how the grace of God worked in this man, he's a man like you and me, he's a human being, he has, um, you know, the grace of God works in, in him, he certainly has his, uh, uh, his, his, his good aspects and less good aspects, like any uh, human being. But it's beautiful to see, uh, to contemplate, I would say, he, he, how God works in his life, how he worked also, what is, uh, you know, you have your temperament, your personality, your, way, your own way to interact with uh, life. I'll be, of course, talking about Father Marie Eugène because Father Marie Eugène, blessed Father Marie Eugène, they were companions, even though there is a difference, a little difference in age, and and um, yeah, the, the 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 moment that they die is, is very distant. I mean, Father Marie Eugène is born 1894, and he dies 1967, while Father Louis dies. 1992. Both uh, are Carmelites, for whoever uh, doesn't know, both are Carmelites, both are French, from the south, southern province of France, 
what is now the southern province. At that time, when Father Marie Eugène entered, it, you had only one province and then they divided. He chose to go in the south. Then Father Louis entered and became a novice where Father Marie Eugène was there, when, where he was the prior. And then, of course, there is a meeting between the two men and, of course, the huge admiration, a certainly a spiritual, powerful spiritual shock in the life of Father Louis seeing Father Marie Eugène, blessed Marie Eugène. Uh, so from there on, it's, it's beautiful to see how uh, things uh, develop. But before talking about this, this would be our second part, if you want, where we focus totally on Father Louis's work, his journey, uh, his production, um, connected constantly with the history of the church, because we have two histories. We have the, 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 narrat the narrative of the, what happens in the church in the last century, and we have, of course, the narrative of Father Louis' Father Louis, um, uh, story and, and development. Okay? But before reaching that, I would like to give you an idea of the background, because otherwise it's impossible to understand last century, especially under the perspective of spiritual life, under the perspective of uh, spiritual theology. So, first thing, today we have a topic in uh, when you study theology, is called spiritual theology. Okay, this is a topic, one of the topics, it's, it's rather a minor, unfortunately, topic, it's not uh, one of the main courses like dogmatics, Bible, sacraments, moral theology, these are the big guys. Hmm? Dogmatics, Bible, dogmatics, sacraments and moral theology, these are the big guys. But then you have smaller, more humble uh, uh, topics, subjects you study. Uh, you have pastoral theology, you have history of course of the church, you have canon law, you have other things and you have the little spiritual theology. But what we live today, what we call spiritual theology, is something very recent in history. It's something that developed in the midst of last century. So, uh, if you were a seminarian in the beginning of last century, you wouldn't hear at all about uh, spiritual theology or the equivalent topics we had before, because around the 30s, 40s, we have a shift in the church. Um, when I talk to ch about the church, of course, unfortunately, it's very restricted to the Western European Catholic Roman Church. Uh, of course, it includes the United States, uh, the Americas, but it's rather the Western side, it's rather the Catholic one, the, not the Eastern ones, etc. Okay, so we are focused on uh, a small circle that goes uh, Rome, France, um, so Italy, France, Spain, um, United Kingdom a little bit, uh, etc. So this is our world. Unfortunately, it's very restricted. But this is where the life of the church was more concentrated before. Now it's uh, everywhere. I mean, as leading, leading the thoughts, uh, the church existed in, in many, in everywhere before, but it was more concentrated there. Okay. Now, so the shift that happens in the 30s and 40s in the documents of the Holy See and the uh, s uh, the authors, the way they name spiritual theology, etc. It wasn't called spiritual theology. It it was um, called ascetic and theology and mystical theology. We had a division between the two. Something that we don't have today, thank God, but something about this division will always be there. Ascetism is, I guess I'm not pronouncing it properly in English, is it ascetism? No, asceticism. Asceticism, sorry about that. Asceticism is mainly the effort 
we produce to answer God's call with, I would add something that maybe at that time wasn't added, is the general help of God given to everybody. It's whatever you can do with a general grace that you have from baptism. Of course, uh, providing you are in a state of grace. Otherwise, you go to confession and then you go back to, to the gen. Okay? Now, mystical theology is something completely different. And here starts a bit the interest of what, all what we will see today. The division here says something that is very important. So some discernment has been achieved throughout the, the various, all these various decades from the, the end of uh, 1800 and throughout the first part of last century, 1900s. Mystical theology is all the, I'm, I'm describing it how it was at that time, is all the extraordinary manifestations of the grace of God. It's not clear yet. I would today say, Father Marie Eugene would say, it's the particular help of the grace of God in us. But when you say the particular, which is simply the personal, direct and personal action of the Holy Spirit in us. So this is general action of, of the Holy Spirit. This is more personal and immediate, immediate work of the Holy Spirit in us. I'm using my terms, our terms today, the people who already attended various courses, these are the expressions we rather use. Teresa of Avila uses them. The general help of the grace of God, the particular help of the grace of God. This, you can find it in St. Thomas Aquinas. It's not, uh, it's not alien. It's, it's, it should be part of our understanding of how God, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, works in us. When I say grace, when I say Holy Spirit, it's rather the same. The Western tradition especially because of St. Augustine, he tends to use, till, uh, till Council Vatican II, more the word grace of God, to, to talk about how God acts in us, the, the work of sanctification in us, no? sanctifying grace of, go of God. No? Uh, the sacraments, we talk about the grace. No? It's an, an invisible grace, the sacrament, or it's a visible sign of an invisible grace. We tend to use grace in the Western world, but in fact it's the immediate result of what the Holy Spirit is doing, nothing else. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us grace of God. This is how the, the Mass starts, no? The grace of God be with you, no? So it's the, the, or the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. It's the same thing, okay? Now, the old division is a result of things that happened before. I will go there uh, in a moment. But I want you just to start to sense the, um, what happened last century, I'll give you a quick background and then we will start to see uh, uh, what happened uh, in, in, in last century. Now, when we talk mystical theology or mysticism, in the 800, 1800s uh, and 1900, early 1900s, we are coming out of a crisis in the church, maybe you never heard of it, but in the world of spiritual theology, in the world of spirituality, uh, we have in the end of the uh, 1600s a crisis which is called quietism, quietism or quietism, hmm? quietismo, hmm? quietism, okay? Some authors, I don't want to enter in too much into detail there because uh, I would divert the attention, um, gave a certain interpretation of spiritual life which was rather, I'm summarizing it, which was rather on the passive attitude. It's like you don't do anything, God does everything. So of course, under the understanding and the light of proper theology of the grace of God, how it works, this cannot be accepted because 
we have to find uh, uh, the balance, the right balance. God starts, it's true, God supports, starts our action, is behind our action, supports our action and help us accomplish our action. But in the same time, what they say in a certain context is correct because it talks about an advanced stage in spiritual life. But if you take it out of its context and spread it everywhere and say this is the way people have to behave, this is very dangerous. This is why a quick condemnation arrived from Rome. So a sort of, sort of ban of mystical life or stronger spiritual life or a spiritual life that is rather passive was happened. The ban happened. We, we sort of excluded that. Even till recently, if you would talk to a, a French priest of a certain age, I'm talking, uh, you know, I'm born in 62, uh, so I, I knew uh, uh, priests uh, throughout the 80s and 90s more closely, you know. Uh, uh, and if you would talk uh, to a priest uh, of a certain uh, generation, older of course, uh, than mine, uh, way older, uh, if you talk about mysticism, the reaction is it's like, no, no, you don't go there. We only want things that we can uh, verify, uh, check, um, control, uh, action, but all that uh, uh, strange, all these strange manifestation, it's, you don't go there. So this was very taxing on the church because without spiritual life, who are we? Without the action of the Holy Spirit, who are we? Nothing. So are we really Christians or are we just, uh, uh, I don't know, Jews or whatever, uh, clothed with, a Christian, uh, uh, with Christian clothes? Uh, you see what I'm trying to say? So it had a very damaging effect on the church. 17, uh, so we are talking 17th century, so 18th century, it, it, it's, it's very damaging. So when Pope Leo XIII encourages the renewal of the studies uh, of Thomas Aquinas, when some authors in the 1800, uh, mid and end 1800, start to write about the graces of that we receive in mental prayer, the different stages, there is a coming back. You can consider that the, 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 the desire and thirst for a deeper spiritual life, for something that goes beyond what we were dealing with, is starting to arrive. So we have a period of renewal that starts more or less with this uh, document of Pope um, uh, Leo XIII, after it, Eterni Patris, it's in August 1879, Leo XIII, Leo XIII, Eterni Patris, you write it this way, so Eterni, and then Patris, this is the name of the document, you can read it, it wants, he wants to promote the return to St. Thomas Aquinas, hence, hence, all the first part of last century, even till now more or less, um, yes, till now, we have a, a, a stream, a current in the church called the Neo-Thomism. The Neo-Thomism. Neo means Arthur, the new, newer version, uh, Thomism. So, which is using the philosophical structure and s system, if, if you want, I don't like the word, and the theological contents of Thomas uh, Aquinas. One of the most prominent figures of this neotomism is Father Garigou Lagrange. Reginald Marie Garigou Lagrange, who is a Dominican. Dominican, who lived, uh, of course, last century, he died very early uh, 60s, maybe 60 or 61, something along these lines. 
he not to be uh, mixed or confused with another Lagrange who is Dominican also who is uh, behind the uh, Ecole Biblique de Jerusalem the, the biblical school of Jerusalem its foundation and all the movement of the um, historic uh, criticism of the Bible it's, and the studies, the archaeological studies, philological studies, etc. Uh, that the church started to accept step by step uh, and integrate and take on board. Now it's common, very common, but at that time, no. So Garrigou Lagrange is, uh, is a different person. He's a theologian and he was extremely important in Rome. Uh, extremely important in Rome. Is uh, French, um, a very influential, um, a very prolific writer. Philosophy and theology and spiritual theology, which at that time was called ascet ascetico, ascetico mystical theology. Okay, now. So we have a, a beginning of a renewal of spiritual, uh, what today we call spiritual theology, in the beginning of last uh, century. This renewal, it's up to us to see it in a positive or, I can't say negative light, but less positive light. This depends on us, this depends on uh, your own culture, your own uh, theological culture, your own understanding of how things uh, uh, happened. But this is a fact. We had this renewal that affected philosophy, theology, and ascetical mystical theology. Ascetical theology and mystical theology, depending on where you are placed in history. Early 1900s, well, it's ascetic and then mystical, but then they unite. Then they are only, they become one book. Today, a manual of spiritual theology is one book, not two books. Even though, even though, if you read, I want to see God, the work of Father Mario Eugène, even though he wouldn't use uh, two books using the under, under the same uh, words, but it's rather, he's rather going in this direction. But he, I, he, I'm sure he doesn't like the, the division and he wouldn't endorse that. But it's the first book of I want to see God, which is called I want to see God till now. We don't have a newer translation, so we have two volumes. I want to see God and I am the daughter of the church. So I want to see God is rather on the early stages of spiritual life. So it's our effort that counts with the general help of the grace of God. Think of the first three mansions of Teresa of Avila. It's our work here that counts. Of course, the grace is constantly good, but it's a general grace. Then, if you enter in the fourth mentions, from the fourth mentions onward, of course, it's mystical. Trees of Avila will call it the supernatural. Not the supernatural in the English uh, meaning today, no, supernatural like mean odd things, mysterious things, no, like ghosts, etc. No, the supernatural in the church, when you use the expression, is something very specific. Supernatural, which means beyond our capacity. Nature is our capacity, super, beyond, which means the direct intervention of the Holy Spirit. So, from the fourth mentions onward, we have the mystical aspect. So, it's not totally uh, odd to distinguish, but if it becomes a division and a separation, that's horrible, because that was the case before. In the, in the, from the crisis of the Quietism, uh, from 17, the uh, 18th century and 19th century, this time uh, we are more focused on the ascetical thing aspect, which is what we are supposed to do, what we can do. You can meditate, you can uh, work on your virtues, you can just uh, be a good uh, Christian, uh, uh, and that's it. And this is what you are supposed to do. The rest is strange, is mysterious, so we don't go there. You see, so we were more focused on, on, on this aspect. Okay, now. Um, what are the elements of the renewal that we witness in the first part of last century. So we're talking 
more or less the 40 uh, first years there. I think this is very important to understand even what is happening today. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to understand what happened in this period. So as I said, it's a moment of renewal. But what is this renewal? There are different aspects and I would like to underline them. There is a current that says that spiritual life starts and is directly linked to baptism. Father Arintero, a Spanish uh, Dominican, promotes a lot this uh, aspect. And today, of course, all this is common. But at that time, it wasn't common. The call to spiritual life comes from baptism, because of baptism. It's not something that comes or might, might come or might not come. The seed itself of baptism is what will develop later on. Today, I say this, you look at me and say, well, pff, we know that. Yeah, but at that time, we didn't. It's like the mystical aspect is something that maybe is not maybe is not necessarily it's, it's not automatic. It doesn't have to come. There are people who are called to a mystical life and people who are not. That's the state of the church at that time. This mystical aspect is not for everybody. That's a big challenge. So what is mystical life? We need to discern and enter inside and discern. Do, do, do you follow what I'm trying to say? So, and, and Father Louis, Father Marie Eugène, Blessed Father Marie Eugène and Father Louis are in the midst of all that. Uh, when they uh, draw closer to uh, the saints, the Carmelite saints, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, when they draw closer to the uh, center of, of the child Jesus, she's, um, she's it's a storm of glory, as it has been described, no? St. Therese of the Child Jesus. She is beatified in uh, um, 1923 and canonized 1925. John of the Cross declared Doctor of the Church 1926. So you see, suddenly there is a rush of interest, huge rush of interest. But still, we want to understand. Therese is like visibly sent by God to the church. Today we don't see her a lot uh, enough as it was at that time. Uh, as I mentioned it before, um, I challenge you to go in any Catholic church in any place in the world. If you don't find an image or a statue of St. Therese, um, it's, it's, you won't. It's, very, it's rare. It's rare if you enter in a church without like a little picture or a statue of St. Therese of the child Jesus. Forget all about all the other saints. She's, she's unique, no? So it's really a huge storm of glory that happens, that, that rises in the beginning of the century. And she is the star. Of, uh, Pope Pius XI, the 11th, said that uh, she is the star of his pontificate. She is the star of his pontificate. He's the one who beatifies her and canonizes her. And she's declared patron of, of the missions. A, a girl who never came out of uh, her, her monastery. Hmm? Interesting, okay? So, the Carmelites. Father Mary Eugène is hugely uh, stroke? Struck. Struck. Struck, yeah, horrible. Struck by Saint Therese. Huge. He's possessed. He's uh, constantly busy by Saint Therese. She enters powerfully in his life as John of the Cross and others, but she is there. She's central in his life. And Father Louis is absolutely the same. He is like almost, you would say, an obsessed by Saint Therese. He spent all his life, I'm talking about Father Louis, uh, Father Louis Guillet, 1902, 1992. He spent all his life to try to understand Therese. Because he got the intuition from the beginning that there is something more than what appears. Uh, in French we say, uh, uh, une spiritualité à l'eau de rose. A spirituality uh, 
how would you say a load of rose? Uh, a gentle, flowery, uh, cuddly, a cuddly spirituality. Uh, so that was more or less what was happening because a lot of miracles were happening through Therese, her intervention. Uh, remember the w First World War, uh, horrible uh, war, 1914-1918. Uh, uh, she appeared to many soldiers. She appeared to many soldiers. Um, um, many of them who re stayed, remained alive uh, um, started to have a great devotion uh, uh, to her. Many people were healed. It continues, but less than uh, that time. So Therese appears first with lots, lots of miracles. The story of the soul is sold like crazy. She starts to be known, but Father Louis sensed from the beginning of his life that there is more to what, is, uh, what one is seeing in Saint Therese. This is why he spent all his life trying to understand her. But Therese also will play an, an important role in the history of spiritual theology. In the history of spiritual theology. And Father Louis' contribution is part of that role. You know, to understand better what is spiritual life, what is the supernatural, how it appears, can, is it for everybody, yes or not. And in Therese you find in a way all the answers or many of the answers but you need some tools you need a method of work in order to enter into la Therese's life without uh, putting her in a smaller box than w w who she is uh, uh, reducing her that's the risk and the temptation so we talked about uh, the call to Mystical life is connected to baptism. So this brings another point, which is, therefore, mystical life is for everybody. So mystical life is for everybody. Which is, by the way, an atomic bomb when you say this. We're not used even today to that, still. Number three, what is mystical life? Within it, we need to distinguish between the extraordinary graces Extraordinary means not for everybody like stigmata, uh, levitation, uh, knowing uh, some things, uh, performing miracles um, Say again Healing, um, yeah, yeah, healing, yeah, healing, um, vision, whatever. So, extraordinary and I would say the ordinary of mystical life. The dis distinguishing between both, th that was a huge step. Because from a rejection of the whole thing, you need to be careful because you are throwing the baby with the dirty water. So you need to keep the baby and throw the dirty water. So the baby is the supernatural action of God in an ordinary life. Because if you say that the whole thing has to be thrown, you are throwing the best, the best thing God can give us ever. You see what I'm trying to say? So the distinction here between the extraordinary phenomena like if you read the, the, the life of Father Pio, Padre Pio, the saint, you could be a little bit overwhelmed if you want to imitate him. Yes or not? Is he in the ordinary side or the extraordinary side? Extraordinary. Definitely, sadly for him, I mean, he would be sad, but it's rather on the extraordinary side. If you take Therese of the child Jesus, and this is the other temptation, is she on the ordinary side or on, on the extraordinary side? Very ordinary side. When she, you know that uh, people who enter deeper in spiritual life, they do have mortification. 
They do practice mortification, all sorts. And at that time, until now, it's still practiced, maybe less, but it's still practiced, you w could use instruments uh, like, um, yes, the silicium, and then you can have like um, a bracelet that has spikes towards your flesh. Or um, a belt that has the spikes, or simply the silicium, which is uh, rather, uh, I don't know the word in English, uh, the very rough material that is constantly... Hair shirts. Huh? Hair shirts. Hair shirts, thank you. Uh, so, and you tighten it, and you spend your day like that, and your years like that, to the point that sometimes it becomes one with your body. When you remove it, you'll bleed, because it's, it's, it becomes part of your body, like a bullet sometimes, uh, a small... Um, uh, small parts of a bullet sometimes or of an explosion enter in the body and stay, stay forever. You ask people who went to, you know, to war, uh, the, 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 the piece of metal remains in the body and becomes part of the body, like a chip today, no? Okay, now, so, <clears throat> when Therese started to practice these uh, uh, extraordinary um, ways of mortifications and penance, she reaches a point very quickly that she, she couldn't bear it. And she stopped. And she said, my way, this is how it's recorded for us today, my way should be practiced, should be easily practiced by everybody. Therefore, I exclude that. I will not take this on board. You see the, the discernment operated here. You see the discernment operated here. She didn't do anything beyond the daily, the daily life, the charity and love and patience and suffering, uh, you know, she was ill, she suffered, etc. Uh, smiling, being kind, trying hmm? all the time, hmm? uh, etc. To the point that uh, you know very well this, no? when they started the process of beatification and canonization, they started to ask, uh, they announced it in the monastery. So one of the nuns who lived with her, what did she say when she heard that? She said, Exactly. She didn't do anything. She didn't do anything. Which means what? Extra ornery. Something that sh would show that she is a saint. You see the, the huge shift. We are coming from a world where holiness means rather the extraordinary bits. You perform miracles. You did uh, by, loc by location, you did, uh, I don't know, name it, you, 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 all of them. Which, by the way, attract people, no? If you go to any apparition place in the world without naming any specific one, what are people seeking? The extraordinary. Because they want a bit of consolation, they want a bit of support, they want to feel that God is there. But talk to them about the the. the the supernatural action of God in the ordinary life, they would be less attracted. Because it's less, it talks less to, to our fantasy, no? You get the point. So, we are here, there is a healing and a purification that is happening through Therese. Therese is, is fundamental in, in spiritual theology, in the change. And I could, even myself, when I meet sometimes people in other countries, uh, and we talk a little bit, like I'm talking religious people, nuns even, you could sense immediately if, they, if Therese entered in their life or not. Because you have people still living without even knowing Therese at all. At all. I mean, Catholics. Who never read the story of the soul. That's, I mean, millions, I'm sure. But your understanding of spiritual life, your understanding of the distinction here, is, is, is um, changes when Therese enters in your life. As she states it toward the end of uh, Manuscript C, she says, when I see the real gospel, the real Jesus, I know in which direction to run. And the direction is not to go up, it's to go down. It's not the inflation, inflating things with extraordinary bits, but it's rather the powerful action of God, yes, but in an apparently ordinary life, spiritual life, lived in faith. Hence, hence, the huge, uh, I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
It's an intuition that led Father Louis Guillet from the beginning till the end of his life, which is, yes, I understand what you are saying, Therese, but I'm sure in this ordinary life, she didn't do anything, huge things happened. And I need to dig and see from what we have, and Father Louis considered, and he told me that, uh, uh, because I, I knew him, I had the, the grace to meet him, you know, from in 86. He died in 92, so I, I met him in uh, June or July 86. Now, he, um, I forgot what I was saying. He was digging in her thing. No, no, no. He said, to, he said that, he said, Saint Therese is, we are talking in the 80s. Maybe it changed now, I don't know, because we have newer saints. We have John Paul II. I mean, yeah, I met John Paul II various times, uh, just like this. No, no, I don't. He doesn't know me more, more than that. No, uh, uh, Mother Teresa, people met her and lived with her. So, so we, now we have a sainthood that is even more documented than, I don't know, St. George. Do you have any information on St. George? Do you have his ID? Do you have uh, his uh, baptism uh, certificate? Uh, do you know where he lived? Do you know what he did? It's, it's all we try to sift uh, between uh, different uh, stories. Even some call them legends, no? It's, it's. So, while if you talk about John Paul II today and say that he is a saint, it is challenging because, I mean, you have people who knew him, you have people even who would say bad things about him. So, it's like, what is sainthood? It, uh, do we come clean uh, when we are saints, uh, like in the opinion of others? Uh, or, or we can still be accused of I don't know what? And what is holiness? It's a big question. But today it's more documented. But I'm talking in the 80s. In the 80s, Still in the 80s, we didn't have that. We didn't have Teresa, Mother Teresa, we didn't have uh, John Paul II, we didn't have Padre Pio. Padre Pio was, was excluded by many priests, by the way. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, now he's a saint, but at that time, or a visionary like uh, Sir Faustina, it's, it's like, who would pay attention to her? I mean, I'm t in the 80s or, or the 70s, this is like, it's like devotional, forget about that. It's, 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 serious. it's not serious, no? But now she's a saint, and her message is, is, is uh, very important. Uh, um, um, the church took it totally on board. There, there is a change. So, in the 80s he said, this is the most documented saint. We have information about her that we never had such information on any other saint. So, hence, the hard work of Father Louis. He spent hours, days, months and years just sitting and reading and checking and reading and rereading and rereading and rereading. This is his life. Might be very boring to you, but he didn't do only that, by the way. Eh? Uh, he served a lot the Carmelite nuns. Uh, he was more non known in the circles of the Carmelite nuns and some lay people, but that's it. That, that was rather his life. This is why, unfortunately, he s is still an unknown person. And this is why I'm doing also my work on him, because I think he deserves to be a known person. But, you know, you don't control that. You don't control that. Uh, I don't think, by the way, if the question is crossing your mind, I don't think you will be canonized um, uh, any day, in, day near. No, I don't think so. I'm not saying he's not a saint. I'm sure he's a saint. But that's not the issue. Uh, you have great people that are not canonized till today just for you to know. Uh, it's not anybody who is worth to be canonized and who is, who will be, he is canonized. Uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Ollier, the founder of the Sulpician Fathers in the 1600, uh, 1600 uh, part of the uh, golden uh, century in France, uh, spiritual, uh, theological, um, uh, faith, uh, golden century in France, and also li literature, etc. Is still waiting to be canonized. He's a founder, and I'm, I personally consider him a, a big saint. Father, uh, 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 yeah, Father, Monsieur Ollier, Monsieur Jean-Jacques uh, Jean Ollier, uh, Ollier, O L L I E R. You have a small booklet that I published a few years ago. It was back on the on the table in the back. Uh, the letter. Extract from the letter of uh, Ollier on the interior life of Mary. Interior life of Mary. So he's still not canonized. His process was stopped at a certain point because 
um, people, I think people are not, were not ready. And I'm maybe not still now not ready. Yes, because he said certain things. He wrote certain things that are very deep in my eyes, but uh, have been misinterpreted. So it stopped the process immediately. Uh, a biographer in the 1800 called Fayon uh, wrote a, a big biography on him. And he added a few things and he uh, unearthed many documents of uh, f uh, f uh, Monsieur Ollier. And it didn't please a everybody. So instead of helping him, <laughs> he stopped the process. So just to say, it's not everybody who deserves to be a declared saint or, or, or who is necessarily uh, it's It's in the hands of God. I mean, it's too complex. I'm, I, I, I don't have anything to say about that. It's just how it is, OK? Um, there is certainly a meaning, but you know, some saints are declared saints in, in less than 10 years. St. So, Teresa of the Child Jesus, she dies in 1897, and she is uh, beatified 1923. It's like 26 years. It's crazy. In the past, like this also, we had some saints. I don't know uh, if Teresa of Avila, I don't remember now the dates, for my shame. Uh, or Saint Ignatius, or one of certain certain things. Yeah, certain saints God wants, and they are immediately. Even vox populi is so powerful that you can't stop it. There's so many miracles, so many people pleased with with the saints that it's like Rome says, okay, well, Bob's your uncle, it's done. Okay, got a point. Now, let us continue here because this is uh, important. Now, one of the uh, so, uh, as you see here, uh, is everybody called to mystical life? We have an audacious beginning of answer, which is yes, but what is mystical life? Now, within that world, you have a big problem here that will appear, which is, what is contemplation? What is contemplation? Contemplation, in a way, embodies the question on what is contemplation, the identity of contemplation, embodies a little bit uh, all these problems. The focus on the issue became huge, became huge. I invite you during the break to have a look, to get a sense of the issue. To have a look at this volume, this is volume 2.2, two. The, the, the full of the Dictionnaire de Spiritualité, Dictionary of Spirituality. This is unique in the history and I'm not sure it will ever be done again. This work starts if physically, if you look at it put together, it, say it starts here, volume 1, volume 17 is here. And this is only on spiritual life. And this work started 1930, 30 what, 35, 34, I don't have the, the date here, but on top of my head I would say 33, 34, by three Jesuits, then taken on board by other three Jesuits. It starts 1930, 34, so number, volume 1, and volume 16, 17 is the uh, index, no? 16, volume 16, is 1995. So you understand that the first article now have less value because the bibliography is very old, while the last article is in 1995. If you are interested, you can come and visit me in my office and have a look at this dictionary. But I, I, on purpose, I brought one volume for you during the break to sense the amount of work that is done, just to have a sense of the huge work that has been done, just take the topic contemplation. Even though, even if you don't understand French, you can decipher. Start contemplation here, uh, column 1643, this is volume 22, and finish contemplation. Where does it finish? And this is only one word. One word. Uh, if you want the entire 17th volume, it's online, people can find it. Uh, you can consult the, uh, the, uh, the work. Uh, it's expensive, by the way. Uh, I was lucky to get it, but 
You see, it's still there. I, I haven't finished contemplation. Is it in French or English? No, no, no. French, please, please. French, French. <laughs> be, be kind, be kind. French, is French. It in huh? No, 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 no. Nobody dare, dare to translate it yet. I don't think it will ever be done. You need to learn French, uh, and that's it. That's the only way. So this is only on contemplation. Contemplation in the philosophers before Christianity, contemplation in other spiritualities, contemplation then you start, contemplation in the early, in the Bible, contemplation in the New Testament, contemplation in St. John, contemplation in St. Paul, contemplation in St. Uh, Clements of Alexandria, Origen. Each one is a separate thing inside of the work. Contemplation, it's, it's more than a book. It's various books and various authors, okay? So just to show you why am I doing this, huh? it's very important to have a look. Please come and have a look. So I will leave the, the first one here and I will tear it so you can see the beginning and the end. So this is the end and this is the beginning, okay? Now, a huge discussion starts between different schools of spirituality in the church. You have the Dominicans, the Jesuits, the main, what, contenders, competitors, the main uh, pr um, protagonists, protagonists. You have the Carmelites also, and maybe some lo uh, lost people in the middle. They use their own, uh, how do you call uh, a scholar magazine, uh, a magazine of scholars, uh, it's not the published, where, where Roger published these things, uh, journal, journal, yes, thank you very much. Journals, different journals, uh, French, Italian, Spanish, a little bit English. So they fight, or discuss, better said, to be kind to, to them, they discuss what is contemplation according to their own school of spirituality. Remember the Jesuits, <laughs> St. Ignatius, their history, their own history. That deserves seriously three, four, five lessons just by itself. The history of the, the Jesuits and spiritual life. It's, it's amazing, it's very interesting and you could be, you, you, you are on to many surprises. Now we have the Dominicans with St. Thomas Aquinas, with uh, some authors even that I haven't mentioned in the... Um, you, you have St. Thomas Aquinas, you have... Uh, um, I forgot his name, um, an, an author in the 16, uh, 17th century, uh, Jean, uh, uh, John of St. Thomas. Thomas. John of St. Thomas, who wrote something on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No, I'm talking to the Dominicans. St. Augustine is the fifth century, we are talking in the second millennium. So, um, you have another, you have the work made by the Carmelites, the reformed Carmelites, the discalced Carmelites in the 17, uh, 1600s, 17th century, called the Salmenticenses. It's the Carmelites, theologians, who, of course, used to teach in the uh, university, the great university of Salamanca in Spain, uh, who wrote a long commentary on the uh, Summa Theologica of St. Thomas Aquinas, but it has been done from a Carmelite perspective. So it's deeper, more juicy, from other commentary who won't be Carmelites. So this is a work that is, um, of course, today nobody speaks about this, uh, very few people, and it's in Latin, so you need to know Latin in order to dive into that. So you have different epochs, like the Dictionnaire de Spiritualité, uh, different persons who took on board the entire Summa Theologica and commented it, of course, with the depth and, and, and perspective of the Carmelite um, um, spirituality and being, yes? What were they called Salmanticensis. Salman... How do you say it in, uh, in, in, in Spanish? Sal... I might be wrong somewhere here. Maybe there is an A, maybe there is no. 
So it's from Salamanca, the people of Salamanca, Salmanticensis, but it's in, in Latin. The skulls come right, absolutely, yeah. We are talking 1600, 1600 onward, onward, 1660, it starts, I think, and then you go and then you cross, you enter in the following century, because one dies, one continues, one takes on board, one is more specialized on, on, on this. So it's different authors, but it's a great commentary. Father Marie Eugène, for instance, just to give you a sense of this, uh, a seminarian used to study theology till a bit before Vatican II in Latin. The books were in Latin, the talks were in Latin. Um, in Rome, everything was in Latin. Today is in Italian, but before it was in Latin. Uh, the lingua franca was Latin. Now the lingua franca is Italian. F it used to be French also with the Latin, but now it's, it's mainly Italian. Forget about the French. And maybe English now. Now, Father Mariogen did read the Salmanticensis. You had them in the, in the convent. I have in PDF a lot of it. It's online, if you can find it. It's very difficult, but I found it. So, but it's in Latin. So, and it's a commentary on Thomas Aquinas. So it's very much digging deep into the articles of Thomas Aquinas, but explained by a Carmelite. And it has always been rated very highly by everybody. Not, not, I'm not talking about the Carmelites, everybody outside of the Carmelite world. It's, it's, a, it's an important work. Father Mary Eugène did always recommend, I remember, uh, Father Bernard, who, who died, of course, in the, in the early 90s, um, who told me, we had to read the San Manchester and we had to work. It was, it was important for us to do it when we studied theology. Uh, so, why am I talking about this? <laughs> the destruction. The destruction. Yeah, the contemplation. Yeah, yeah. the Dominicans with uh, Jean, Jean, John of St. Thomas, who wrote uh, a work on the, uh, the Holy Spirit. Then, uh, you have another author, uh, uh, I forgot the name now, don't worry, it's in the, uh, he's in the um, uh, 1800, who takes on board a work from, uh, I think his name is Menard, Father Menard, um, uh, who takes on board also a work done by Carmelites. So you have like summas, Summas of spiritual theology in the 1800, 1700, 1800, but they are in Latin. I have one of them downstairs. It's, it's done by a, a, a Carmelite. It's the first one, then very quickly imitated uh, by a, a Dominican. Then this continues. And then finally, some, uh, one of them is translated into f uh, French in the 1800. Plus, after all that, all the work of the actual living ones take the most important one is Father Garigou Lagrange. So you have the, 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 the Dominican school, the Jesuit school, the Carmelites with rather Father uh, Gabriel uh, of St. Mary Magdalene. Um, he's, uh, I think, uh, from Belgium. Um, he speaks, of course, uh, French, uh, so from the French side, but he lived in Rome uh, a lot, almost all his life. Um, and wrote in Italian in the end, of course, very fluently, um, etc. So, the discussion comes here about what? About what is contemplation? But what in contemplation? Is contemplation acquired or infused? Acquired or infused. We are still following the distinction, not between ordinary and extraordinary, but the distinction between ascetic and mystical. Acquired means you can have it, you can do it by yourself. Infused means it can only happen if God gives you the grace. So the discussion is, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to, pr to produce an effort? and wait until something happens? Are we supposed to produce an effort, which means ascetical, and stop there, and this is contemplation for the rest of your life? You understand what is at stake here? It's still the grace of God, still, 
And the three authors that will be cited, uh, quoted a lot, are St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Teresa of Avila, and St. John of the Cross. Thank God. So even the Jesuits had to go there. Because St. Jesuits don't have any of this. So they only have the ex spiritual exercises. They don't have anything else. And they have their own history. It's a very, uh, how do you say, travagliata, very labored, that's the word, labored history about spiritual life, uh, accepting the mystical aspect of it, mental prayer, it's a big issue. Uh, that deserves really is very interesting. It has been studied by um, uh, Father Melchiades Andres Martin, he's a, he's a, he's a, um, a Spanish uh, priest, uh, scholar, um, very important uh, in Spain. He, he died, huh? died, I don't know, recently, I mean, maybe 2009 or a bit before. Um, he contributed a lot in uh, rediscovering uh, the Siglo de Oro, the uh, golden century in Spain. Um, and he did uh, different seminars organized for a master's degree where different people contributed and then a book comes out. Uh, so we have two main huge works. I, I have both of them here. Uh, one is uh, Los Recogidos, the Recollect. Uh, this helps us to understand what in fact will be crystallized by trees of Avila the movement of recollection, how you recollect yourself. It starts in the end of the 1400s, like the last two decades of the 1400s, 1480, 90, and then you cross, you enter in St. Teresa's century. Uh, in Spain, we are in Spain and only in Spain here. Uh, so um, he studied this movement and very interesting, what I was saying, to see how the Jesuits who are recently founded in the uh, golden century. This is when St. Ignatius, Saint Ignatius founded the, the, the Jesuits. When Teresa of Avila, uh, Teresa of Avila is, uh, is in Avila, in nine, uh, during a little bit before her conversion, uh, which is 1554, 1554, a little bit before her conver second conversion, uh, the, the Jesuits just arrived in, in Avila. So it's a, like a recent order, uh, like the Brothers of Saint Jean. It's, it's, it's recent, the founder is, is, is there or just died a, a few years before. So they are still finding their way. So it's very interesting, the, the older chapter in the book Los Recogidos, it's a big thing, a eh? big thing like that. Uh, Los Recogidos of Melquiades Andres to see how the movement of mental prayer, which we call today prayer of the heart or mental prayer or contemplative of silent or silent prayer, whatever, all this, all these words, this moment of silence, how the Jesuits reacted to that, because that was everywhere in Spain. All the orders were touched by that movement of Los Recogidos. It's not only the Carmelites who talks about recollection, it's all Spain was talking about recollection. And then you had possible deviations like the Alumbrados, uh, who uh, sort of a little bit take it a little bit like, uh, car, car, uh, car, just for you to understand, charismatics who went off, off, off tangent, no? Uh, take charismatics, but send them a little bit out of tangent, so they will become like illuminated, no? It's like they know, they have visions, etc. and then they, and then, so the Inquisition is there, by the way. Mm? And trying to <laughs> control all that, or to, to, to protect a little bit. Plus the uh, Erasmus, uh, a tendency of renewal of the Bible. Uh, we didn't invent the Bible now. The Bible existed before, uh, and the renewal of the Bible, etc. Then stopping the Bible from the market in vernacular, etc. So, coming back to what I was saying, this book studies uh, a little bit the reaction of the Jesuits to contemplative prayer. Very interesting. Very interesting. I won't say a word now because it would divert your focus, but it's very interesting, you see, because they don't have that. So when you discuss contemplation, go back now to the 41st years of last century, all that is there in their mind. Uh, uh, what do you do with the uh, spiritual 
uh, what do you do with the intervention of God? Is contemplation infused or acquired? And the Jesuits, in general, they are more on the side of the ascet ascetical side or on the what you can do and achieve. This is how it became. But if you look at St. Ignatius, if you look at some great spiritual uh, Jesuits, the option is di very different. So that's the history of the Jesuits. I won't go there. I'm not uh, entitled today to do that. Okay? So this discussion about the nature of contemplation, is it acquired and infused, will last around till, till probably toward the end of the 40s. Father Mario Eugène and Father Louis are contemporaries of this. I will say one word and then we'll take a, a short break. Sh very short because time is running. I haven't even started with Father Louis. Uh, but I think it's, it's important for us to understand the church. And uh, you need to know the church, to love the church, and understand that we, have, we deal with things today, but they have a history. You deal sometimes with fruits. Today you are, uh, how do you say, ra ra uh, reaping? Uh, reaping? Reaping. Reaping, sorry, I forgot always this word. You are reaping the fruits of all this. Today there are things that are very obvious. At that time, no, forget about it. Even religious life, forget about mystic mystical life. You'd spend your entire religious life, forget about anything that deals with uh, the supernatural action of God. Do you understand? in which world we lived. We had moral behavior without the core of it. So you create what? You create a disaster because you are forcing people from outside. They are not generating life from inside. So you create hugely frustrated people. You understand a lot about the history of what is happening. I won't go further than that, you, or just open your eyes, and open the eyes of your mind. So, if you kill spiritual life, you don't allow it even to, to be, and say, no, this is not for us, this is for other people, what happens? You impose a vision of Catholicism, which is rather on the moral side, more than on the spiritual side. It's just 60 years ago. We live in a different world. We, we live in a luxurious world today, where these things are okay, they're accepted. But at that time, they weren't even on the, on the menu. It was, no, don't go there. I remember the priest, no? Uh, la mystique. Oh, no, 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 no. Let us not talk about this. Let us talk about charity, uh, pas pastoral action, uh, preaching the gospel, uh, taking care of people. This is what we are supposed to do. Forget about this, we don't go there. It's like a... It's like a it's like uh, you don't go there. It's, 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 a, it's a mystery and uh, it's, it's even bad. It's bad. We don't go there. You understand? That, this is, so what type of Christians do you produce? What type of religious life do you produce? What type of priest do you produce? I met a priest. I used to go, when I, every time I go to Lourdes, I used to meet a priest. He, he died now. Father André Doz. He, he, um, he was chaplain at Lourdes. And at that time, he was already old. And he told me something about Father Louis. He said, many years ago, when I was in the seminary, Father Louis Gier came and gave us a talk. And this talk remained in my mind for the rest of my life. But it's like the only ray of, life, of light, maybe, that, that, uh, uh, that entered, that talked to him about something that is not what he's learning, something else. He talked about, of course, spiritual life, uh, etc., but something else. You see what I'm trying to say? So it was like a revelation for him. Then, then he, he had to do it by himself. It's like it's, you do it by yourself, your spiritual life. Okay? So you understand uh, uh, that these discussions are fundamental. Is, is the cont contemplation for everybody? Is it acquired? Is it infused? What will happen? Can you describe the development of it? Do you, you will sense something? Will you see something? Are you expecting to see something? Etc. Uh, Etc. Etc. Et you see the questions? And, and, and I'm finishing this first part. 
I read re recently uh, this book um, of, I don't know them, uh, Manuel Belda and Javier uh, Cessé. Uh, I don't know how you pronounce it in, in Spanish. It's, it's a Spanish uh, book, unfortunately, for, for you. Uh, not for you or for you, but for others. Uh, the title is the, the Mystical Question, which is all this. This, is, this has been called the mystical question or the mystical discussion. Hmm? La question mystique. It's like, let, let us try to understand mystical life. So the book is La question mystica, estudio histórico teológico de una controversia. Est, an historical theological, historical theological uh, study of a controversy. In his opinion, all these discussions bore fruits in the end with a final common agreement on what is contemplation. I was shocked to read that because from my own school it's not the case at all. We haven't reached a common agreement. So you see, you can have different opinions in the church, it's fine. We are not fighting, we are just voicing our understanding of, of, of the issue. Now, uh, <clears throat> did it bear fruits? We had a huge discussion. In my opinion, and I always say to people um, when we are uh, eating together or having a coffee or something, I say we have never reached an agreement and the proof of that is that we don't have any document official document in the church that states a, a, a correct definition of contemplation. The Catechism of the Catholic Church offers a definition, but it's, in my eyes, too general. Yes, it states the, inf the infused part, which is the necessity of God communicating himself to us, but how do we reach contemplation? What is really happening? Are there strangers, etc.? It's still, it's still general and, and vague. Uh, now, uh, let us have five minutes uh, break and then uh, come back. But please come and touch the books. Now, um, yeah, I, I, I know <laughs> I take too much time to explain certain things because they are, I, I find them very interesting, but I don't know if you feel. On Louis, no, there is no book written on Louis. There is a, 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 an issue of the uh, uh, small uh, Carmelite magazine, it's one article and that's it. Uh, and extracts from his words, no, his books, no. We don't have a book, a proper book, no. Because, as you will see, uh, if on one hand, uh, Blessed Marie Eugène was like the sun, very sunny person, very shining, very uh, active, uh, Father Louis was more on the, more, not only introvert, but he's more an intellectual and more of a silent and working with the nuns. He worked a lot with the nuns. Um, in France first, and then in Canada. And then in, in Canada, because his last 20 years he spent them in Canada. I'll, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Um, now, <coughs> we have, so, this is one drawing. The red point, this is the first century, 1900. And we are here, say, 1970, onward. The two red areas here are moments of renewal. And when I say moment of renewal, you need to be very careful, because in any moment of renewal, you have also deviations and misinterpretations. But per se, if, if you try to be very faithful to God, you find that it's the Holy Spirit behind that movement. So the Holy Spirit is generating a rush of renewal here in the 41st years, but here I'm underlining the 21st years. And then here we have Council Vatican II, which is a time of renewal, despite all what can be said about the Council. It's a work of the Holy Spirit, and if you read it carefully and if you follow, the persons who remained faithful to the Holy Spirit in the correct interpretation, there is matter of renewal. But of course, it becomes quite disastrous in different um, areas or aspects of... But it's normal. Eh? Growth, you have poss possibility of, of deviation also. So, Father Louis 
and Father Marie Eugène, but here now we are talking more about Father Louis Guillet. Hmm? Louis Guillet. I, let me write his name because otherwise. Louis. And then Guillet. Um, he's a Vendéen from uh, the Vendée area in, in, in France. He's born in a small town uh, there. Now, Father Louis Guillet lives in the church, senses what is happening, and certainly is moved by all these uh, events and these impulses of renewal uh, in the church. So we have different waves in his life. Uh, of, of, of work. I have here, if you are interested, the entire bibliography of all what, what he wrote between articles and books. He has 14 books published. 14 published books. They are rather on the small size. This is, uh, for instance, a book called Thérèse dans ma vie. Thérèse, which is Saint Thérèse, the, the French one, the Thérèse of Lisieux. Thérèse in my life. This is 1972. Uh, the book is, looks small, but you know, uh, it's more than 200 pages. I will talk about the way he works. Um, very rarely you would go over that size. Um, you have here the biggest ones. This is a posthumous work. Uh, yeah, we are 350 pages, and this is his th synthesis. Yes, 300, almost 370 pages. Uh, here, voyez quel amour uh, d'Ontario. I'll, I'll speak. Of course, unfortunately, it is very frustrating for you, and I, and I, I have great empathy to your frustration. Everything is in French. Um, I maybe he has one or two books translated into Italian, and that's it. Unfortunately. As I said, if Father Mario Jean became very known, very shiny, Father Louis remained rather on the circles of the Carmelite nuns. So let me just say, so we have various articles. I, don't, uh, I haven't calculated the, the number of articles, uh, but I know the books are uh, 14 uh, books. I have some of them here, but plenty others uh, downstairs in my office. Now, the books come rather towards the latter period of his life, which is a little bit consoling now when you see a man in his 70s uh, having uh, the most uh, prolific production in his 70s, I think it's consoling. Uh, till well till in his 80s, he still produces books. It's impressive. But it's very interesting to see that Father Louis has a long period of preparation. Even though he produces, even though with different waves, uh, he uh, studies thoroughly John of the Cross. You need to see his book of St. John of the Cross. I had it one day in my hand. I think now it's with the Camelot nuns of Quebec, the city of Quebec. Uh, it's called Tewkesbury, their monastery is a little bit outside, I went there um, because they have a lot of his um, recordings, uh, written things, so they, they are the ones who inherited a little bit. So I needed to go there in order to get as much as I could from, from them. Very kindly, very generous nuns. They helped me a lot for the PhD, for the documents I needed. But anyway, so uh, what was I saying? Yeah, he, he has different waves of when uh, his duties allow him. Remember, it, it, being provincial of the southern province of the Carmelites was shared between, sometimes between either Father Mario Jean or him. So when Father Mario Jean dies, he's provincial. Um, he orders. Um, toward the last days of Father Mario Jean, he orders the uh, members of the uh, institute that he founded, because he died in the institute, to write down his final words. This is how we have Father Mario Jean final words in the last two or three days. And they're all written because of Father Louis who asked them to write them down. Um, he wrote a beautiful article on Father uh, Mario Jean 
uh, in the uh, um, 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 how you call it review. Uh, yeah, Le, Le Carmel. How, what was the word you, you gave me? Journal. journal, yeah. It's like a journal, thank you. A French Carmelite journal of the, uh, uh, called uh, Carmel, uh, or Le Carmel in the beginning, but I think it became Carmel only. There is, uh, in 68, if I'm not wrong, uh, there is uh, uh, a special uh, issue only on Father Marriage, and I have it downstairs. And in it, you have a beautiful article written by Father Louis, called The Spiritual Master, The Spiritual Master, talking uh, of uh, Father uh, Marie Eugène. Remember that in, in my personal understanding, it's only my opinion, that probably the best one who paid attention and tried to understand Father Marie Eugène is Father Louis. Again, the best one who focused on him and tried to understand him and, and read or, and, and listened to all what he said as a faithful disciple for the well first 10-15 years and then as a colleague uh, uh, for the rest of their lives uh, together is Father uh, Louis Guillet. Now, he, he profusely talked to me about uh, uh, different issues about Father Marie Eugène but Always with Father Louis, it was a, th a theological point, never going into life things or no, he wasn't interested. He was interested only on what can help us love Jesus. So spiritual theology for uh, Father Louis was uh, the knowledge that help us, the teaching, the doctrine that, that help us to love Jesus. A beautiful uh, de uh, definition, by the way. No? Always he repeats it everywhere in his work. No? What we want to know from Therese, what we want to know from John of the Cross, is how to learn how to love Jesus. But of course, it goes to huge depth and beautiful developments. Uh, he's just following John of the Cross. His great master is John of the Cross. No discussion about that. His dream is always to see a young fellow reading John of the Cross. For him, that was, that's it. I accomplished my mission in life. To, um, to invite and see uh, young youngsters opening John of the Cross and becoming, um, um, yeah, f falling in love with, with, with the, uh, John of the Cross and his teaching. Uh, remember, and, and allow me just to be, uh, it's a bit eclectic, but it <coughs> it's a very important to understand that Father Louis is not first and foremost only an intellectual sitting on his, at his desk. Father Louis is a, is, a, is a teacher and a preacher. He gives conferences, he gives talks, endless. I have long lists, only from the Carmelite nuns toward the end of his life of the amount of teaching he gave. It's incredible. He, his rhythm was four conferences per week for years and years and years to the to the Carmelite nuns and two to the the community and two to the novices the first one is theoretical the second one is questions and answer the first one is theoretical for the novices the second one is question and answer what was important for him was how do we live our spiritual life and of course he's talking to nuns in the monastery so for him Therese is the most important person uh, it is like this. For him, it's a little bit of an embodiment of Our Lady. Um, there are aspects that are silent in the life of Father Louis, but you can read them between the lines, and there are aspects that are explicitly stated. I would say, if I have to de describe Father Louis, that Father Louis's main person in life, apart, of course, from the Lord, is Our Lady. But you will very hardly have that stated as clearly and explicit as, as I am stating it. Uh, in his life, you have, from the beginning, <coughs> uh, 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 something about Our Lady, and we will never know, because he never said it. Father Louis was extremely discreet. He never talked about himself. I could talk about hours for, about him, but unfortunately I had to place, situate the whole story. In the beginning of his life, he has a book with Father Marie Eugène, the only book they co-wrote, and it is not mentioned, strangely, in the bibliography of the, I want to see God in the back of it, there is a bibliography about Father Louis, and you don't have the book mentioned, and I have the photocopy of the book here. It's a book on Our Lady, uh, written, La vie mariale au Carmel, the uh, Marian life in Carmel, 
wrote in 1943, never mentioned by Notre Dame de Vie. I think they feel a little bit ashamed of, of the, the text. I don't know why would you feel ashamed uh, by the text. Uh, this is how, this is a photocopy, eh? Uh, La vie mariale au Carmel, the Marian life on Carmel. You won't find it easily uh, in any place. Um, uh, many years ago I had it, but then I asked recently to have the photocopy because I, I didn't own it uh, before. This book is co-written between Father Marie Eugène and Father Louis. It shows you something about the attachment that both had to Our Lady. Uh, they are Carmelites. I want to give you a, a talk on um, Our Lady in Carmel. She's everything in the Carmelite life. But I'm trying to explain who is Father Louis and how he functions. Father, for Father Louis, Our Lady is, is central, but apart from this early text and toward the end of his, li his life, we have another text, which is a huge study he makes in the uh, journal uh, La Vie Thérésienne, uh, Annal de Saint Thérèse. Uh, we have uh, an amazing uh, work uh, he did on Thérèse, and Our Lady. And throughout his life, from time to time, you have either a, chap a chapter in a book or an allusion or one or two articles, but that's it. So the beginning of his life and the end of his life, and sometimes throughout, you have <coughs> clear uh, talk and description or, 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 or uh, explanation about Our Lady in spiritual life. But this is the hidden part. Now, what is the explicit part and uh, what is his method of work? The explicit part is Therese. Remember Therese's impact on Father Louis, and Father Marie Eugène and Father Louis and people around was huge. But Father Louis <coughs> approached her with huge respect and sometimes with a little bit of fear because, the fa as I said, he knew that there is more, way more in her than what it appears. But for Father Louis, Therese is a small Virgin Mary. Of course, don't take it too literally. Uh, it would be heretical. But you understand how he sees her. This is the veneration and admiration he has for Therese. This is why he is obsessed all his life about Therese. Why? Because Therese lived our Lady, and in fact he's interested by Our Lady, but he never says it. He only, you have to read really all his work and find the, the, the little gems when he says that Therese is a little summary of Our Lady. So Our Lady, we don't know many things about her. We, have, we hardly know anything about her from the Gospel I'm talking, no, explicitly. But about Therese, we know everything, or almost everything. This is why, if you consider, you see the, the, the mathematical uh, uh, reasoning, no? If Therese is a small uh, Virgin Mary offered to us as an example, and Therese is offering the common way for everybody. So don't say, I'm weak. Therese says, if you are weak, well then you are mine, you are with me. If you are strong, you are not with me. So Therese is revolutionizing spiritual life and offering uh, the, all the abundance of the gospel, all the abundance of the graces of God, union with God and beyond, she's offering it, God is offering it through her to us. All the teaching of Therese of Avila and John of the Cross, hmm, Therese of Avila and John of the Cross, is embodied in Therese in the best way, in the best way. So we have all the teaching of the saints of the Carmel embodied in her, our Lady, this is the silent message, uh, Our Lady is embodied in her. So, come on, your life is here, your, your mission is here. You need to understand how, and remember he deals with nuns, how will you, my dear sisters, uh, imagine, no, he's talking to, to them, you will learn from her and live as she lived. Maybe they will say, oh, you've never done anything in your life. But that's not my, his goal. His goal is to try to dig and go inside and understand what they're doing. Now, he says in one of his books that uh, people think that he studied uh, John of the Cross for the sake of just studying John of the Cross. 
He says, no, I studied John of the Cross because I had the intuition, this is stated in his book, Therese in my life, no? Therese dans ma vie. Here, he, he states that. Hmm? Uh, he says, I was studying John of the Cross because I, I knew that he will be the one to explain to me uh, Therese and give me Therese as she is not as we could put her in the little box of our brain. Of course, the little box of our brain, this is me talking, I'm just wording what, what his, his thought. So, <clears throat> he felt all his life, throughout his life, a great insatisfaction coming from all the commentaries that he read, and he read them avidly, I'm quoting him, avidly, all what came out about St. Therese. Remember, he's a, like a specialist of, of Saint Therese. So anything that comes out, we are talking till 92. Well, let us say 86 to be more not too hard on, on him. Hmm? Till 86, so he's 84. Hmm? He reads everything that comes out. But he always feels a great insatisfaction in the sense that they are not giving us all Therese or the most important part of Therese, or certain aspects of Therese, etc. Okay? So all his work is to help the nuns. And, and, and another point here is very important. In his mind, when you say Carmelite nuns, you say lay people. You'd be very surprised, but this is how he thinks. He considers that a mother, no, a wife and mother, what he says is, uh, is uh, um, meant for her as it is meant for the Carmelite nuns. In his mind, there is no distinction. In this sense, he is very much post-conciliar, post-Council Vatican II. Hmm? So the basic vocation for him is a lay vocation. He is totally in tune with Council Vatican II. He took it on board which in fact is all the debates that happened before. Is it coming from baptism, the spiritual life, or so is it for everybody, yes or not? So all this is integrated. But for him it is spontaneous. If he talks, if when he writes, he writes to everybody. He writes to lay people, he writes to a mother in her daily life and their daily struggles. And he writes also for the nuns. But I think that his lab, no, if you are a uh, specialized in chemistry or biology, you enter in a lab. I think his lab was the nuns, the Carmelite nuns. He served them, and by the way, his uh, sister was a Carmelite nun. So, but, <coughs> but these are information, we don't have anything more. He never said anything about his sister, so we don't know. Uh, I need maybe to write to the monastery where she lived, and maybe I won't get anything. He was a very discreet person. He let the saints talk, but he shut up. Or it's better to say he talked allowing, uh, through them. Uh, he, he sent a message through them. Now, he served the Lord, the Carmelite nuns. Uh, um, one, one little thing. Before Council Vatican II, Pius XII decided that all the different monasteries in the world, and including uh, the Carmelite ones, have to gather into federations. They have to be federated. Which is not the initial idea of St. Teresa of Avila, but Pius XII and the Carmelites thought that that was a good thing in order to help the monasteries, because some monasteries would be too isolated and would be left alone without any help. So they had to find a balance between the federation and the personal government of each monastery as St. Teresa of Avila wanted it, which is the prior prioress and her council are the one who decide everything. Nobody interferes. And of course with the local superior. It's either the, the bishop or the provincial, the Carmelite provincial. This is how they work till today in the, in the world. Now, <coughs> with the federations, they started to gather. They had a first gathering at the, Cam at the Camel of Lisieux. All the prioresses of all the French monasteries, and remember at that time, France had more than 110 monasteries. Um, yeah, almost all ma main city had a monastery, Carmelite monastery. Now, no, the, the number went down. Spain, the same, by the way. Italy, the same. Uh, maybe not 100, but uh, same figures. I mean, Italy, if I remember well, in the 80s, it was like 60-something. In Spain, I, I'm sure way more. Um, 
<laughs> so I'm talking to the Skulls Carmelite nuns, huh? Carmelites, the cloistered ones. So he served, that was official, no, he intervened in these gatherings and then they had the different federations and he intervened a lot and the meetings were happening at Notre Dame de Vie. Notre Dame de Vie is where Father Marie Eugène, the, the, the institute, the secular institute that Father Marie Eugène, Father Marie Eugène founded. So Father Louis would go a lot there and he would have all the I mean, not all the Carmelites, but the, the, some of them who would be gathering from all the monasteries, so imagine the number, and he would give them t uh, teaching. Then he moved on also, of course, this is on top of visiting the, the Carmelites, giving retreats and giving spiritual direction. You have to add all this, uh, talks, etc. Um, now, you have also tr tridiums or celebrations of, uh, I don't know, uh, the year of Our Lady, the year of salvation, the year of this. I mean, you, you are busy all the time, no? And here comes a another interesting thing. Remember, Council Vatican II is a renewal. He's inviting all, this is Council Vatican II, this is the arrow of renewal. So this is Vatican II, this is the arrow of renewal. So we are here 60, 65 onwards. Council Vatican II is asking all religious orders to renew themselves. It's a very delicate operation. What will you keep? What will you remove? Uh, the way you practice obedience was done in a certain way. Now we are invited to a more responsible obedience. The way you practice ascesis and mortification was done in a certain point. Now we do it in a different point, etc., uh, etc. Et it's a long list of things that the church is inviting all religious orders to go back to the, the sources of inspiration, to their founders, to the early writings, and renew themselves. And of course, first and foremost, of course, the gospel. The gospel. More evangelical life, more simplified, etc. So, the daily life is affected, but also your spirituality could gain a lot from that effort. And Father Louis, I would say, embraced totally that effort of going back to the um, uh, saints, the Carmelite saints, going back to the gospel and to the Carmelite saints, and having uh, animating different, um, it's not retreats, it's like seminars with uh, different communities. Maybe he would do it in one community and some nuns will come from another community and they will gather in this community. And I'm thinking more of uh, Quebec. Uh, or Canada. You had four communities there, if I'm not wrong, and these gatherings did happen in, in one or two of these uh, monasteries there. I have the listing and I have the topics and I have even written, dactylographed, all the contents of the discussions between him and the nuns. So you see here a man, a priest, a religious, a real Carmelite, trying to help the nuns, but the level of discussion, the, the quality of the discussion and the listening and the rhythm is simply amazing. The books, especially the last books, are also the fruits of his work with the Carmelites. His books are always taught first, then written. You see what I'm trying to say? Any book you find in this period, which is the most abundant period in his life, his production, uh, is first taught, then written in a better form as a book, you uh, sift and remove all the added things. All, always very scientific, huge number of quotes. Uh, to the point that some of his brothers always said that Father Louis' works smell the notes. <laughs> ça sent, ça sent les, 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 les notes. It's like too much. Sometimes you have an entire page of notes. Uh, uh, just references for one point, for one point. Just a reference to show that what he's saying is supported by this. So, life is, spiritual life is the starting point, and mainly at this, at this moment in his life, I'm not saying that it wasn't the case before, but I'm just describing how he took on board the renewal that the church asked for, and how he enacted it. So he worked hardly with the nuns, but first and foremost, you would be surprised to see how he took stage by stage, pieces, sometimes turning points in spiritual life, and discussed it. And that was the session he gave to the, to the nuns. 
there is a session you have for uh, postulants and novices and who whoever is interested. What is the, the subject of the, uh, the, the, the session? It's why too many failures? Failures. Pourquoi tant d'échecs? But what is failure? Failure is not in my vocation. No, this is with Father Louis talking. It's something completely different. It's failure to enter in the mystical life described by Teresa of Avila. It's like you would remain in your own circle, going around in circles, in an area where you should normally live something of St. Teresa of Avila or St. Therese, and you are not living it. So there are junctions. The moment de passage, like bridges between a state and another, a stage, sorry, and another stage. So the entire session was only on that. It's like you entered in the monastery, in our case, you started spiritual life, you start with rather more active mind, meditating, etc. But God wants now to call you to a little more, more quiet and silent state, more passive in a way. So the passage between one state and the other is delicate because you might not see it. What are the conditions? So he starts with discussions. Then they are distributed and they have text they have to read and analyze and he listens to the nuns. He made them work a lot. I have piles of dactylo... Uh, because at the time we didn't have computer, so it's the dactylographie. Tap, huh? Typing. So, yeah, typewriting, tapping. Uh, um, quotes on, I don't know, uh, the supernatural action of God from John of the Cross, from the Mount, uh, Saint of Mount Carmel, this, 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 he turned two, three, four, five, six pages, then uh, from uh, Dark Knight, he turned the pages. So it's all work. Now we do it quicker, but with the computer is way quicker, but at that time, nuns were working. <laughs> okay, so, so it shows how life and teaching the teaching should serve the life. But it's a delicate relationship between teaching and life. So to see that renewed effort, which wasn't done, by the way, when we had the huge discussion about is uh, contemplation acquired or uh, infused, where is it? Is contemplation acquired or infused? Here we are on each junction from one step to the other in the spiritual growth, but here we are in the lab, which means we have the life here, and we have a fully committed life, so no hesitation. We are here trying our best, and we are trying to see how it works, but always guided by John of the Cross and, and Teresa of Avila and Saint Therese. So all his effort, I would describe now and, and unfortunately conclude, all his effort toward uh, all his life was, and you can see it in his synthesis that he publishes in, uh, this is a bit like I want to see God, but it's in one volume and way smaller. You see, we are in the 70s, we are not anymore in the 40s. Yes, yes, unfortunately, all in French. It's 1977, published 1978, Voyez quel amour Dieu nous donne. See what God, uh, what love God is giving us. This is his synthesis. Remember, in a previous uh, talk on the, my thesis, I underlined the fourth part of this, which was after union, which was a totally new uh, one. So, if you take this one and also the posthumous work that we have, Seigneur, augmente en nous la foi. Lord, increase in us. Faith, our faith, or oh, faith. Mm? Seigneur, augmente nous la foi. This, in fact, this book is on the true nature of contemplation. And he didn't want to publish it, to, uh, he didn't want it to be published while he was alive. Why? Because he was discussing old things and he didn't want to be harsh on the Father Garigou Lagrange and Maritain in their interpretation of contemplation. So, all his life he tried to see how faith grows, how our spiritual life grows, 
And do we have necessarily to sense things or see things? Can we reach the heights of spiritual life without necessarily having any extraordinary manifestation? Which is the case of St. Therese. That was the, ch the huge challenge. Some theologians read the life of St. Therese and they didn't see any of the stages of Teresa of Avila or John of the Cross in her. He read her without, again, putting her into a, a narrow box. But he saw that she reached the fullness of, of love, as described by John of the Cross and St. Therese of Avila. So he, he shows throughout his books that there is more into that, but how does it happen? And then, and then the main question, are you supposed to sense, are you supposed to feel? And the, and the great surprise, if you read it carefully, the answer is simply no. You might have an extra grace in your life, but the normal course of your life, what is happening, is happening between your spirit and God. But if God doesn't want to pour something in your soul and in your body, he won't. But it doesn't mean that you are not growing. Of course, with conditions, no? Of, of fulfilling certain conditions of growth. Because not, growth doesn't happen just like this, okay? So, in my eyes, he puts a final say to an, an important issue of contemplation. Uh, the Dominican school, followed even by Father Mario Gen, used to talk about connaturalité. Connaturalité. Connatural. Connatural. Contemplation is connatural. And it was described as an action in our will, of God, in our will that was seen and perceived by our mind or intellect. This is how it is described by Garigou Lagrange, Father Garigou Lagrange, and Jacques Maritain, the French uh, philosopher, who was very close to Garigou Lagrange. So contemplation was described by the Dominican as an action of God in our will. So it's unity first, then it is perceived by connaturalité, like in a connatural way, by the mind. This is how, at least let us put it this way in order not to offend anybody, how it was understood by Father Marie Eugène and mainly, of course, by Father Louis. You can find the description of this either in Garigou Lagrange or in Maritain or in I want to see God or also in Father Louis. But Father Louis says, this exists, but that's not contemplation as John of the Cross describes it. John of the Cross says that contemplation is a direct action on the mind and on the will, but deep in the spirit. Not less or first, not less in the mind or first in the will, no, equally God gives himself to our mind, he pronounces his son, we participate into the generation of the son, and spirits loves in our will the Holy Spirit, but in equal quality and equal divine manner. So we reach here an understanding of contemplation as a direct action of God in the mind, but we're talking the, the, the mind of our spirit, the, the, our spirit. Because the spirit is mind and the soul is mind. But the spirit's mind is more passive, is more elevated, can deal directly with God. I would need, of course, more time, but I'm sure you can understand that because I have explained the difference. No? You have the mind. I know I have to stop, but... So, if this is the soul, you have the mind, the conscious mind, and if this is the spirit here, our spirit, not the spirit, uh, spirit uh, the Holy Spirit, our spirit, both are mind and will. Mind and will, both of, of them. But one is receptive, passive, and beyond consciousness. And the other one, the iron mind and will, is, uh, you perceive it, it's conscious, 
and you are more active in this area. This is John of the Cross who talks here, it's not Father Louis. Then God, God of course, is here. So when God will give his contemplation, he gives to both the mind and the will directly. Not the will here, and then the mind will perceive it, which is a completely different thing. The difference between a version and the other is huge. And sincerely, having gone through that, that issue myself, it's very liberating to find the uh, description of John of the Cross as it is and not translated wrongly or interpreted wrongly. So again, the interpretation of the Dominican school, the neo-Thomistical Dominican school, I'm not saying this is Thomas Aquinas, I'm saying this is the neo-Thomistical one main representative of the neo-Thomistical school, don't get me wrong. It says God acts directly first in the will and then the mind becomes aware. Here we are talking about something completely different. We are talking not about this mind and will, we are talking about the mind and will of the spirit and God acts equally, divinely, directly to them. That gives completely a different outcome. Because here God generates his son into our receptive, beyond consciousness son, um, uh, spirit and directly loves in us and through us with his Holy Spirit. It's direct and direct here and there. While the other interpretation was contemplation is what the mind perceives of what God in a unitive way here with the will realized. You see the, the journey? So, huh? which one? The last one? The interpretation is when God unites himself to our will the mind contemplates, receives an input from that union, and this then is contemplation. And it is called connatural. It's connatural effect. Connatural, which means with God. So this is, you find this in Father uh, Marie Eugène, that's clearly stated, and of course, you find it in Garigou and Marita. But Father Louis, delicately, he never, he's a very humble person. He, this is why he didn't want to, to, to be published while he was alive. Anyway, um, he delicately only speaks about Marita. He doesn't want to include Garigou and uh, Father Marie Eugène. But de facto, they are all saying, this, the three of them are saying the same thing. So here it is. So, when you say that contemplation, when you reach that clarity, and it took him years, Father Louis, it took him years. I, won't, I can't go into, uh, I couldn't come, uh, go into the, the details. When you find that clarity, that contemplation is something that you cannot perceive, of course, it could be felt as frustrating, but it is liberating at the same time, which means when you practice the prayer of the heart or you practice adoration, you are not meant to experience something. And if you experience something, which does happen, it's not the core of the grace, because the core of the grace is a direct action of God in your mind and spirit, uh, mind and, uh, and, and will of your spirit, receptive and passive. So you can't perceive it. When you receive communion, let us be clear, when you receive communion, do you feel God himself? No, you might feel a bit of recollection, a bit of peace, exceptionally one or twice in your life you might feel something very strong, but that's it. So you feel just a certain recollection. You know he's there, but you don't have a direct feeling. So when you receive communion, you are receiving the Son, you are receiving the Holy Spirit, of course directly to your spirit. You are contemplating. This is why the Greek uh, writer, Byzantine writes, sings after communion, we have seen the true light. So who saw the true light? Your spirit, not the conscious will or mind. So when you reach that clarity of saying, no, you are not supposed to expect anything when you practice mental prayer, it's frustrating on one hand because there's nothing to be seen, but on the other hand, because only the spirit can see God. That's John of the, this is pure John of the Cross. Pure John of the Cross. You can read John of the Cross, the four main works, in both direct, all directions, you will always find that, that clarity. So, you understand that the very depth of spiritual life means that you can have an amazing 
union with God here, but you, are, you live like, you don't necessarily have a perception of it. I remember very well Father Louis saying to me, you will meet people who are united with God, and he meant spiritual marriage, but they don't know it. And there you don't have to tell them. You will understand because of your, you know, your job of, of spiritual direction, but you're not supposed to, 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 to tell them. It's just give them the direction of what they're supposed to do, but that's it. We go back to Therese. What did she do? Nothing. But did she have a life full of God? Yes. Did she really serve God to the maximum? Absolutely, yes. We're not saying, oh, yeah, so sit down and then everything will happen. No. But what we are saying is the direct action of God is in faith. It's the, 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 the most advanced stage of faith is still not visible to the eye of the soul. Uh, to the soul, let us say. But to the spirit, yes. We have seen God. You receive communion, you can sing with all your heart. I am seeing God. But who is seeing, in, who in you, or which part in you is seeing God? It's your spirit. So Father Louis contributed a lot, in my humble opinion, to clarify that point. Because, and then it serves many other purposes. It has implications in, 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 in all directions. I, 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 I don't have time to, to explain. It has, of course, implication in the subject I'm studying, but it comes from the beginning. So he analyzes the different stages of growth and shows the distinction between what God communicates to the spirit and what God may communicate to the soul and, 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 and the body, and, or may not. You, you okay? Okay. I, uh, unfortunately, I have to stop. Um, I don't know if it is helping what I'm saying. I understand your frustration because you can't access the text of Father Louis. But again and again, um, I consider him as a great huge, great person. Um, I won't tell you to which extent, you will be scandalized. Uh, but intellectually and spiritually, and his charity and, and love, you find, I find, I think, you find the main qualities that are needed uh, in him. Um, and I wish maybe within, I don't know, two, one or two centuries, uh, that um, his light might appear in a, in a clearer, under a clearer, um, under clearer light. Um, and people will, will, will be able to value the greatness of this man. Uh, unfortunately, he was very discreet, so there's no chance to be, he didn't make any noise, so. And not only that, but he went through the most difficult uh, moment in the, life, in the life of the church in the modern history. <coughs> The 60s and the 70s uh, are the, one of the most horrendous. Uh, it, it's a moment of renewal and purification, but also, this is why I, I wanted to show the positive aspects of the post council time, which he contributed to it. You could see him, he's faithful. Of course, he, he made certainly mistakes, he allowed some freedom, and that had disastrous effects on his province, but he, because he deeply believed in freedom. But freedom for him meant. Uh, commitment, commitment, work, uh, giving yourself, and not just inventing new, uh, strange, funny things. No. So, uh, what was I saying? I lost, I lost the thing. So, um, yeah, a time, a time, of, and a time, of course, of misinterpretations. He didn't. He's not part of that. Uh, and it's it's beautiful, and you can uh, what he did, what he tried to do how he tried to re renew himself first. Renew uh, the, his sisters and, and, and intellectual, at least, his, his brothers. Um, and, I, and, and I remember his last words. Um, he said, all my life, I spent all my life uh, so that the Carmel can be the Carmel. And, um, and he added simple life, uh, humility, uh, charity, uh, etc. But of course, contemplation was He's a big uh, subject, you know. Even within Alzheimer, he was perfectly capable. He had Alzheimer in the end, the last two years. He lost it completely. But I met him uh, just three days before he died. Initially, he didn't recognize me, but uh, then he asked the brothers, oh, go and find uh, X. 
So he, he, he comes, oh, Father, he wants to see you. I said, oh, Father, he, he didn't recognize me. He said, no, 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 he wants to see you. Now I entered, he said, now I know who you are. And he had f I had full Father Louis as I had him before. Capable of speaking about contemplation uh, things. And he said many things to me. And I didn't know, but that was the last time I met him. Because uh, the following day, he fell again from the, his bed. He broke his uh, uh, hip. He went to the clinic and he died a few days after. So for me, that was the last time I met him. He died the 3rd of July, um, 1992. So, 1992. Where was he based? Which was he based? The, at the end, Montpellier, because Montpellier was the place where all the old priests, all the Carmelites will, will then be gathered because uh, the youngsters and the, the first generation and the last generation where uh, the novices and the elderly were all gathered in the same convent, the convent of Montpellier, the Carmelite in Montpellier. So he was there the last two years, but before that, during the crisis of the church in the early 70s, till uh, these last two years, he was at Quebec essentially, and he used to come to France only uh, in summer. This is how I met him. I met him because he used to come and give some uh, talks and uh, sessions on, on John of the Cross. This is how I met him in 86, 87, and then later. Okay, so it's, he's not only a saint, he's very useful for the church, but one day maybe we will pay attention uh, to him. Um, I contacted uh, some publishers, etc. They said, no, we are, these books uh, are, will not be republished, republished, it's the end, it's finished, it's like leave us alone, um, it's, that's it. So. Um, how and when, I don't know. Um, I hope I'll be able to, to finish my, my, my thesis. Uh, it's very hard work, but uh, you can be great and be totally unknown. Because of circumstances, because of your personality, because of your type of service, intellectual life, serving the nuns, you don't make that noise. Eh? And he's the type of, of a person who is very faithful to the church, no? He wouldn't question, no? I had a discussion between one of the brothers and him years ago when one of these books came out. Uh, uh, what uh, Teresa of Avila believed, what John of the Cross believed, that was the trend, no? Uh, a book comes out, what did they believe, no? Ce que croyait Jean de la Croix. So one of the brothers said, in your book you are not saying what they believed in. He said, come on, of course they believed all what the church believes, but that's not the point. The point is how they believed. You see the type of, uh, voila, very humble person, extremely humble person. I begged him to do certain things, he, <laughs> he wouldn't do them, he wouldn't do them. Well, out of, I don't know, humility. Uh, uh, I begged him, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe in 87, I said to him, uh, give me a word, no? Give me uh, something. Because he, he comes and goes, goes back to Canada, I don't see him for, for the whole year. So he said, I said, give me a word, give me an advice or something. He didn't give me. Three days, repeating, repeating, repeating. In the end, he wrote a little, on a little uh, piece of paper, put it inside of a little envelope. He wrote, uh, quoting the Lord, um, um, uh, learn from me uh, as I am uh, hum meek and humble of, of heart. So meek and humble of heart, uh, this is how we have to live our life. So that was his message for, for me, you know, to... You see, it's the gospel, he's, he's not uh, funny. Anyway, I would talk for hours about this man. So, unfortunately, you have saints, you have doctors, you have everything, but a man who deserves to be all that will, will probably never uh, have all that. Because, uh, I think because God hides, and uh, he reveals himself to whoever hides also. Uh, this is John of the Cross, not me. God hides. You are truly a hidden God. Uh, Isaiah, requoted by John of the Cross. God is truly a hidden God. And uh, whoever hides himself, like you don't want to, uh, is the one who will find uh, the hidden Lord. Hide yourself to find the hidden uh, one. On that note, let us say, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.